So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining. Uh, for This is the third day of the FinTech Tour 20. FinTech Tour 20 is the largest uh, cluster of FinTech events happening in the Middle East. I'm, I'm Saga Shah, part of the FinTech uh, Saudi team, and thank you for joining us for this lunchtime session. We're pleased to have Steve Monaghan with us. Uh, Steve is the general partner of at FinMarie, a limited partner and investment committee member in True Global Ventures, uh, vice chairman of Boardless, Healthcare Mobile China, a board member of Pulse Global, and a private investor in artificial intelligence, life sciences, health tech, and fintech. So extremely knowledgeable uh, and, and really pleased to have Steve with us today. Uh, Steve is a frequent presenter, author, and lecturer around the world on subjects including innovation, banking, insurance, working capital, artificial intelligence, and investing. He's also served as an advisor to Intel, Astri, AIA, Veritas Genetics, I had the pleasure of hearing Steve uh, speak during the SMU, uh, Singapore Management University executive course, which FinTech Saudi ran earlier in the year. And I can say without doubt that he's one of the most insightful speakers uh, that I've had the pleasure of listening to. So we are thrilled that he's agreed to give a keynote a lecture during the FinTech tour on digital economics and delivering value at scale. Um, thank you all for joining on this lunchtime session. I know we've got, you've got a few more people joining. Uh, we will be taking Q&As at the end. Feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself. Uh, feel free to add any Q&As, and then we will cover those at the end. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to Steve. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Sega. I'll just uh, share my screen. Voila. I think, uh, I think the uh, introduction was a bit too polite. Uh, it just means that I'm old. So uh, welcome everyone. And uh, I'd like to share with you today some insights on some of the things that uh, I've been working at at Finmarai and also taking into the region, of course, uh, with, uh, with Riyadh Bank. Uh, of course, nothing confidential here. So this is more about really the fundamentals of technology. I began my life in the, in the tech industry. So I ran the product groups for Dell and Compaq across Asia Pacific. Uh, and then I was set on Intel's advisory boards, et cetera. Um, but I think the most valuable experience was me not only managing the product, but actually uh, really developing the pricing models, et cetera. So it gave me quite a unique insight into how unit economics work. Uh, and that I'd like to share with you today. So we'll just get the focus and we're good to go. So today's uh, focus is really how do you deliver value at scale? And that's really the key challenge in anything from a technology standpoint. How do you really make technology work for you and get the benefits of what technology can do? And that's why I'm really a fan of being digital, not of digitization. And you'll see why today. Steve Jobs is a very famous guy. And what he's most famous for is when he returned to Apple, he said, start with the customer experience and work back to the technology. This is the foundation of any transformation. I've managed transformations. I was DBS's first chief innovation officer. Then I went and set up the innovation group at AIA. And really customer experiences and understanding the customer is the start of any technology application. And I think after we know that Apple's hit above the two trillion mark. So I think that we can take that lesson as fully understood. So if you were to look at this, if I was to give it to you as a present, you would probably be not that thrilled. If I then showed you pretty much the same thing in this format, you probably still wouldn't be excited. But I think you can see what happens when you look at time, pressure, and design, that you can really create something that really exceeds anything that was related in the past. And I think that this is summed up in Einstein's theory of relativity. And why this is very important is that when we look at innovation, everyone's going to look at exactly the same item and have a very different viewpoint depending on the way that they're looking at it. That theory and that frame of reference is, is incredibly important for making sure that we really appreciate everyone's point of view, but equally not be limited by it. The basic principles that Steve Jobs articulated was really about the science of why we buy. And I kind of sum that up in this simple analogy of just being easy. The Beers is very famous for creating the diamond ring. And as they, you can see, they applied great design. They created something that was really compelling that emotionally engaged with customers and really made them really desire that, uh, that particular item. However, 
it's not enough just to have something that looks good. People have to rationalize their decisions. So while we buy with emotion, we make our decisions with logic. And that's still not enough to fulfill the, the full formula because we won't take action unless it's easy. And those three things have to exist side by side in human decision-making to enable us to have a great customer experience. And so whenever we design something, we really need to make it easy. And very simply, experience engages emotion. We as human beings are highly emotional. Our decisions are often driven by emotion, justified with logic, and then we'll take action when it's easy enough to achieve. Simple and easy are often confused to be the same thing, but the reality is simple is cognitive. So it's simple is something that we decide with our logic in our heads and we make the decision on whether to move or not. So it's a cognitive process. Ease is the amount of effort that it actually takes to execute the decision that we've made. And that's a very important distinction between simple and easy. Simple cognitive, ease is effort. And what happens when we don't get that formula right, we end up with what I'd refer to in Asia as HSBC internet banking. Neither there on the simplistic side in terms of simple understanding of how to use something and it's not there on the effort side. When you combine these three factors together, you come up with something compelling. And it's wound up in all the, most all the statements. And I understand from the Middle East, this is perhaps not the best example, but I used to have a Tesla and I love my Tesla, but the rational, the simple logic was it's good for the environment. And the effort side was that it didn't require any servicing other than tires. If I look at coffee, I love my Nespresso because I can enjoy quality coffee and the machine cleans itself. Again, emotional engagement, simple rationale and, uh, and hits on the effort side. Amazon, I love shopping at Amazon because I can buy what I need with the one click checkout. Again, we hit all those three items of ESE. So very simply, it's good for business when we really think about customer experience in these terms. It's not enough just to understand design. We also have to understand that design is part art, part science. And it's important to make the distinction between the two. As I often say, art you can appreciate, science you can measure. So when we start to think about design, how do you value design? It's not easy to do. If we look at it from this perspective, if we were to put this spec out and look at each of the individual features and functions of that particular uh, offering, then it's very hard to distinguish which is the right actual uh, car to buy. If we add another piece of information, which is price, that will logically take us in sometimes in different directions. But what really happens is we make our decisions from the other way down. We will often look at the brand, then look at the feature set and the price and then make our decisions. So the brand is often what drives the emotional engagement. Price is part of the simple logic. And then our, our rationale and ease of effort really decides about can we access what we want and what we've already made our decision to buy in an easy enough fashion. But when it comes to pure design, design is, and because it's emotional, it's highly individual. Everyone's going to have a favorite and it's very hard to value what that is till it's done. If you design a pretty website, you don't know no matter how much you invest, whether you've really achieved an emotional engagement till you actually test it with customers. So design by itself is very hard to measure. But there are two things that are quite easy to measure in that formula simplicity and ease. So I've been lucky enough to work with a, a, an interesting company called iSky Research, which I believe is now setting up in, in the Middle East. And what they do, and we helped co-develop this, was to start looking at simplicity and ease and start measuring and ascertaining that. So if you have a look at the example that's on the screen today, you will see that BBVA for the process of registering a device, uh, device is actually the best US experience, uh, UX experience that you can get. However, if you look at the consistency of how they deliver UX, you'll see that they're actually ranked the worst in two other categories, changing email and locking cards. And what's interesting about that, while BBVA is an acknowledged leader in UX design, the two things that they fail the worst at are the two things that are most important to customers when something goes wrong. They want resolution there and then 
and yet it's the hardest thing to get from BBVA. What a framework which measures simplicity and ease does is enables you to now deliver UX with consistency across all functions that you deliver to customers. And I think that that's a very important thing to, uh, to get in the habit of. And if we look at the results and impact, then I think that's also interesting. What Apple's been able to do and pioneer with its design thinking, and I was a competitor back when it began the process, is it's able to take often inferior technology and bundle up with simplicity and ease to deliver a superior customer experience. By combining design, simplicity, and ease, they can often sell older technology at a much higher premium. And what drives that premium is really what they do around design. So when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, he and, uh, and iPad, et cetera, is what he did is he, through simplicity of design and interaction and really thinking about customer experience, he was able to attract two new generations of users and sell that technology at a massive premium to what was available in the market, even though technically spec for spec, competitors had a much better product. And that's the value of design, something that you can't really quantify upfront to what's delivered on the emotional side, but you can definitely quantify in terms of the simplicity and ease, which is why with Steve Jobs and the iPhone, he was able to get babies able to swipe and start using technology. And if you've seen babies trying to, uh, to swipe magazines, they don't really understand how that works now. So he completely changed behavioral interaction with technology. So ESE, I think, is a very important framework for everything we do around customer design. But of course, transformation is much more than that. It really comes back to how we define critical roles around leadership, building a culture of innovation, and understanding how we use technology effectively. The old method of technology adoption in banks, and if you think about it, what a bank used to be is someone that bought technology, branded it under their brand and extended it out to customers. And the process was usually around deploying capital to purchase technology, then trying to work out how to fit with it. So venturing with the technology. And then the learning was that that technology really didn't fit their business models in many instances. There were too many trade-offs in actually delivering the business model. That old method of technology, which saw enormous amounts of waste in you know, a dependency on legacy infrastructure that became so complicated to maintain and, and, uh, and keep current, basically held an industry back from truly innovating with technology. Because what technology really does is it enables us to learn faster. When we truly understand technology, we have a time advantage. And the real thing that we need to understand with technology is we need to be able to turn a no into a no. And that's very important for anyone that works in innovation. When we try to introduce something new, the first answer, if someone doesn't understand the technology is no. We have to help them through learning to actually shift them from no to no. We have to remove the threat of technology to enable people to be able to say yes because knowledge empowers you. It's really the key to what we do in innovation. So we have to flip the whole model. And what we pioneered at DBS was to flip that model through learning, venturing and capital. You know, how to transfer that learning inside and get the whole organization engaged around learning so they're in a position to know and say go versus not know and say stop. So learning, venturing, giving the ability to now take that learning, put it into, into software, and then deliver it in, in a constant cycle of test and learn, test and learn out with customers. And then we use capital purely to scale and accelerate adoption. To be able to do that effectively, we really need to take that learning because that learning precedes action. Once we have that learning in place, we have the capacity to take action. What's very important in our industry is to understand what technology does for you. So the first thing is that time is, of course, money. We understand this well in banking. Time is, of course, also in financial services, risk. A little bit of a lag on the screen here. but. Uh, 
Time is risk. And if we don't take action in time, we're often left with a legacy that of old technology. And of course, what's interesting with technology is that time and risk are the foundations of finance. And the sole purpose of technology is to arbitrage time. So if we look at that in a holistic context, if you've got a, an industry that's driven by time in terms of risk and money, and then you have technology which can arbitrage time, technology creates a huge advantage in our industry. It creates a competitive advantage. And if you're able to have a time advantage and a competitive advantage, you live in your competitor's future. This was taught to me by a former uh, three-letter acronym employee who used to run the global infrastructure for AI uh, for that US intelligence service. He said, if you could act ahead of your competitors, you knew what they were going to know in the future, you lived in their future. And that was really competitive advantage. But to understand that from a technology standpoint, we have to understand the three core things that drive technology adoption. These were the first things that I learned when I moved into the technology industry. Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, Kreider's law. Moore's law, as we know, was uh, developed by the chairman of, uh, of Intel at the time. And it states that uh, the processing power or the number of transistors on every uh, piece of silicon doubles every 18 months for the same cost. So Gordon Moore said, basically, our decision-making capability on silicon doubles every 18 months for the same cost. Metcalf Law is Robert Metcalf, the uh, CEO of uh, 3Com. He stated that the value of a network grows at the square of its participants. Now, this is particularly important because it's really about the value of networks. And Kreider's Law, uh, which came, I think, out of one of the, uh, I think it was Seagate technology, uh, Kreider's Law states that storage doubles every 13 months for the same cost. So each of these core technologies are growing on exponential curves. And if we look at it in a different way, this is about processing, networks, and data. If we look at it from a different angle or a different point of relativity, this is about our ability to use technology to assimilate learning into knowledge. So artificial intelligence, AI, machine learning, however you'd like to refer to it, sits at the confluence of these three core technology laws. Moore's law, of course, is, uh, is slowly coming to an end, but what's really important is it's being replaced by something faster. So if we have a look at technology economics and we start looking now at what that means, when you have exponential technology, what you see in the middle is the number of camera sensors in the world. Now, if you look at the far right, you see that graph to scale. And that stopped uh, the latest information that I could update was to 2017. The top of that graph would have almost doubled, if not tripled by now, uh, given the deployments of cameras around the world. That only describes one part of the data element. The second is that you've moved from 1975 from uh, 0.01 megapixel now to 108 megapixels, which means that you would have to X the, the Y axis by about uh, 1,000 times or the height of the building that I'm in now to truly see how much data has come off the back of those sensors, which is why, why AI initially focused on imaging because you start to had such an enormous amount of data growth. When you look at Moore's law and you understand that the last processor, which was the Skylake, uh, just prior to the latest release uh, a month or two ago, had 2.99 billion transistors on the piece of silicon. And if you have a look at the Cerebrus process, uh, processor, which is now being released, it has 1.2 trillion transistors. And remember what a transistor is, is a binary point where it says that once an electron hits it, there's a decision point. It's either I or O. So your ability to make decisions scales enormously with a lot of the new technology that's coming out. And when you get, of course, to quantum computing, you could anything up to between uh, 100 to 500 million times the current compute power, which, and what's really important about quantum is that you're starting to actually, instead of doing things in a serial nature as we do as human beings, you're now able to simultaneously process. 
which means that you're arbitraging time in a way that's not been possible before, which is why there's all sorts of implications on everything from core security, bank security, down to blockchain, which today, um, because we approach things in a serial way, is seen to be relatively safe. Quantum changes everything because it arbitrages time to the maximum extent. So when we think about technology economics, hopefully we've got a feel for how that operates. But I wanna take you through how the actual math works. So if you look back in 1975, the cost of that 0 0.01 megapixel camera was 28,500 US dollars. 1975, that was the estimated retail price for 0 0.01 megapixel. If we fast forward now, the current Samsung phone, which I have in my hand, is 108 megapixels. And that cost, when it was released, $1,300. And as we know, that, that price has already come down significantly. So if we look at just the feature appreciation from 0.1 megapixel, no one would buy 0 0.01 megapixel now. That's 100 pixels by 100 pixels. It's less than an icon. Now, if we assume that we will always want better and better cameras, that feature appreciation is about 23% per annum just for the camera alone. But when we look at the Samsung Ultra, it's actually so much more than a camera. It's also the equivalent of a 1990s supercomputer, a 1990s data center, and it's a music, video, and health platform. So you could actually use 23% per annum feature appreciation or value appreciation from a customer's perspective, their expectation of technology uh, as being a baseline. If we flip that and look at the cost side of the equation, one kilobyte of memory, or if I put it up to a per meg price was $11,378 per meg. If you fast forward again to the beginning of 2020, you could buy a four terabyte micro SD card for 748 US dollars. That represents an annual depreciation rate of about 33% per annum for 45 years. So now if you've got value appreciation going up, so customers' expectations of technology uh, appreciating every year, and then you've got depreciation, you can see what damage is done if you have a five year uh, backlog in your technology. It means you're basically delivering junk to market that's valued by no one. So the ultimate is that technology is very much like sushi. You wouldn't re eat three, year, uh, three day or three year old sushi. It's really something that has to be consumed quickly because that value gap is about 56% per annum. So when I used to do the pricing algorithms for Dell and, and for Compaq, that's kind of the depreciation rates that we'd look at which is why we would never sell last year's computer. You know, so in the technology industry, it's as important to kill as it is to create. And believe me, banking is becoming a technology driven company. So every year consumers expectations are better, faster and cheaper. And when we think about agile and we often hear agile, it's a culture of agile, it's not. Agile is a reflection of technology economics. You either get it done quick. It has a time, you know, has a, a short time horizon to actually deliver that value to market or it's considered waste. So agile, to get to an agile culture, cultures are not created by putting them first. Cultures are created by having a shared language, learning and common experiences. And that's the result of actually putting in learning into action. So now if we look and we understand technology economics, now we can apply that to digital economics, which more directly affects us in banking. So when we start delivering platforms to market, there are two core vectors that we need to think about. One is on our portfolio and the other is on the network or the distribution depth. And what's quite interesting from a digital economics standpoint is that your platform or your investment in that core app or that core platform or, or your core technology infrastructure, that's considered a fixed asset. So if I have a thousand dollar fixed asset and I have two customers, my marginal cost is $500 a customer. If I have a thousand customers, now I've only got $1 marginal cost per customer, which is what you start to see 
that economics being reflected in unit costing in the banking industry today and in insurance for insure tech. So you're starting to see unit, unit economics um, starting to prevail in terms of what that does if your cost base or your marginal cost base is declining with scale, it means that your margins are continuing to improve. So if you have a look at Metro Miles, uh, which is a US insurer, if you have a look at their latest investment deck, if you can get your hands on it, all they talk about is unit economics and how that actually improves their margins over time. So, but there are two vectors, portfolio optimization and network depth. So this on network depth, our objective is to take our platform and to scale it as much as possible. And then from a portfolio perspective, we use portfolio to drive incremental margin because our marginal cost of acquisition is very low. So obviously the more we scale it, the lower the marginal cost and the more uh, value that we can pump over that same distribution network obviously starts to improve our margins because not only does it bring in incremental margin on top, it also continues to decrease our, uh, our cost per unit uh, from a distribution standpoint. And then finally, Nirvana is when we can deliver an optimized portfolio across a highly scaled network depth. And that is what you see happening in digital economics for all tech companies. So minimize the fixed asset cost, maximize network depth and distribution, optimize your portfolio. It can be bad to have too many products in your portfolio. And then you really win when you optimize both those vectors. If I explain to you how WeChat, uh, uh, if you're familiar with it, WeChat is the you know, predominant messaging app in China. It began as a company, uh, as Tencent. It began as a product called QQ. It scaled to 750 million customers. So they really nailed network depth. But what they couldn't nail is optimizing the product portfolio. So instead of trying to tack on other products to that network, what they did is they completely reinvented into a product called WeChat. And WeChat is what's known as a super app. And what they do is create a highly connected internal platform of connected products. So one product drives the other product, which also drives back to that product. And so you're building network effect by connecting many networks and many applications minimizing core barriers to entry and consumer ease of use, such as uh, log on, KYC, et cetera. So the idea of removing all that friction helps to optimize customer utilization, which also helps to optimize your returns from creating highly connected products in your portfolio. In the tech industry, it's as important to kill as it is to create. So we often kill products rather than just add them in, a, in an additive fashion as we do in finance. As we move more towards machine to machine, and particularly this will be the case with open banking, optimizing portfolio will become an art in its own right. It's a discipline inside the tech industry and it has to become a discipline inside the financial services industry. So if we understand technology economics and digital economics, then it becomes very easy to look at the way new digital banks are forming and we can see how they accelerate and decelerate. And often that's to do with the complexity within their portfolios. So it's very easy to start seeing mistakes when they make things too complicated. If you remember what drove Apple's growth was that Steve Jobs was very, very disciplined about what he focused on and what he didn't focus on. So he built very tight product portfolios. You could have an iPhone in black or in white. You could have it in 32 or 64 when it came out. They were your choices. As a customer, I could walk into an Apple store and almost name their entire product lineup from memory. Highly logical. MacBook Air, 13, 15 inch screen, 256, 512. That was it. Very, very simple. We need to take that same simplicity, that ESE, Experience, simple, easy. We need to take that through to the way that we manage our portfolios in financial services. If we look at it from an economic standpoint, it's very easy to see why financial services is declining in terms of its value vis-a-vis -vis tech and fintech companies. If you see that our average PE ratios pre-crisis 
have moved from 14x down to 11x, even when markets are growing madly. And at the same time, big tech is accelerating from 17 to 22 and fintech from 39 to 49, which is flowing through from the profitability line right up to your PE ratios. So if you're looking at it from a capital allocation standpoint, of course your investment is going to go where you're getting increasing margins because of digital economics versus putting them into highly or unscalable uh, existing asset growth, such as branch networks, et cetera. And that's what makes digital economics so appealing. And it makes it very important given what we've just been through with COVID. Because during COVID, we've managed to force people, if you'd like to think of it that way, to go through the learning curve of digital adoption. It is highly unlikely that people will move back from that investment of learning to return it to something that's physical unless we've designed our digital experiences badly. So in quick summary, from any digital product in any company, you always have very simple digital objectives. And that is simplicity outside, intelligence inside, and embedded everywhere. And that way you're able to really scale your digital economics. So when we start thinking about evolving technology and adopting new technologies, it's very important that we also go back and think about metrics because as we've learned through history, the metrics of the past aren't necessarily the metrics of the future. So if we go back into imagine ourselves in the 1700s on horseback riding through the, the Midwest in the, in the US, how would you measure progress on horseback? The best that you can do is say, I'm three days from Carson City. So I'm measuring progress by proximity. The next generation of personal transport comes out. Henry Ford delivers in 1908 uh, the, uh, the car, the, the T8 uh, car, and uh, Henry, sorry, the Model T car. And what that does is how do you measure progress now? Well, in I think it was 1904, they patented the ability to measure rotational velocity of the wheels and then to calculate out from the circumference of the wheel to work out how far you've traveled and they came up with a measure of miles per hour. So now we have an ability to measure rotational velocity was the way we captured and we measured miles per hour. Then along comes the next generation of transport, no wheels. So the Wright brothers came out, how did they measure progress? Well, the way that they had to, to ensure performance was to measure airflow over the camber of the wing or the curvature at the top of the wing. So they applied a ribbon to the strut to ensure that they had enough airflow to be able to continue, which implied a certain amount of airspeed. Next generation of transport comes along. Jet, no way that you can attach a ribbon to a strut. Struts don't exist anymore. So how do you measure progress? So what you'll see if you've got very keen eyesight is to the right of the nose cone is something called a pitot tube. And what the pitot tube measures is air impact coming in. So now you've got the ability to start measuring air impact and then use ratios depending on what height and, and what air density you're operating in to calculate your relative airspeed and your true airspeed over the ground in addition to, to modern technologies such as GPS, et cetera. But pitot tube, air impact. Next generation of technology, there's no air in space. You can't measure that technology using any of those old tools before. You've got to start looking at new metrics. So now they're looking at, at different sorts of relative measures. It's very much the same in management. We can't measure what we do in digital by applying the old metrics. It just doesn't work. We need to, like space travel, start looking at core physics and start understanding core acceleration and, uh, and velocity. Acceleration is really the key. So the leadership challenge is to really reframe that. And the challenge in most organizations is our expectations of technology are very high. However, what we find inside is not always what we expect from, uh, from an operating standpoint. Now our competitors are changing. And so we have a lot of barriers as a, an existing industry to overcome if we're going to compete in the technology world. As we've seen, companies like Google are rapidly moving in 
to financial services. They've talked about it for a long time. Now they're moving into accounts in partnerships with banks. But where they're really starting to shine is, of course, they understand true technology and digital economics in ways that, that traditional incumbents do not. So when I think of innovation, I think it's always important to understand innovation in, in terms of physics. So if we look at Newton's three laws, I also refer to them as the innovation laws. And for any innovation practitioners in, in the uh, audience, then you will appreciate this. So the first is if you're walking into an organization with large complexity, politics, all that same, it's very clear, change requires force. So if you have an object that's uh, in a steady state of motion or continue in that steady state, unless you apply force to change its direction. That's the first law of, of innovation and the first law of physics from Sir Isaac Newton. The second is that when you apply that force for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, which means that all change will be resisted. These are the laws of physics and they're also the laws of innovation inside any corporation. So we've got to expect that resistance and often that resistance as I've alluded to earlier is driven by a lack of knowledge. We don't wanna sit there in a table and talk about uh, quantum computing. And if you've never heard about it, your only responsible answer has to be no. If you haven't heard of it, no board director, no senior manager could possibly support something that they don't understand. So learning at every level of the organization is incredibly important. Then of course comes the final law, force equals mass times acceleration. Now acceleration or alpha, if we refer to it in finance, Alpha is growth and that's what we're after. We're really after that acceleration. That's what digital does for us. That leaves us with two core things, force and mass. Now in a bank, mass is the number of people and the complexity of the technology and the size of the network, which leaves you with force, which is the only two forces we can apply, are people and capital. So what companies like Google do, they realize that to transform a huge organization is going to be difficult. So what did they do? They created Alphabet. What is Alphabet? It's their moonshot division, but what it really is, is it's a way of lowering mass to give startups, internal startups or new acquisitions, the ability to start scaling and accelerating without the encumbrance of a big mass of the, mass, uh, of the organization outside which enables them to use relatively less capital, less people, because what they're really after is the outcome, which is alpha. And of course, when it gets to a certain size, so you saw DeepMind completely segregated from Google in the past, now slowly moving into the main organization as it moves mainstream because it's big enough, mature enough, safe enough to actually now become a core part of the operating business. So why do so many digital transformations fail? And I've been through ones that have been very successful and ones that have been dismal failures, um, but I think there's a common reason. So the first thing that we need to think about is that tech projects rarely fail because of technology. They, you know, technology is quite predictable today. Very rarely do things fail just because of technology. Where projects really fail, is because of people and politics. It's be and usually if I go to the root cause of that, it goes back to learning and not understanding what's, uh, what capabilities or what the technology does or, or an understanding of the implications of, of economics, et cetera. So people and politics get in the way and people are often afraid to say that they don't know something which is why learning and having learning in, inside the organization is so important. Learning actually enables us to start scaling and removing resistance in the organization. So at DBS, we began programs where the board were heavily engaged in the learning program. I'd frequently go to board to help them, not for approvals, just purely to help them understand what was happening with technology, economics, et cetera. And then at the management level, same thing from the, the exec teams down through to, the, to every level of the organization. So if you look at DBS today, every single person in the organization is trained in human-centered design. They're trained in Python so they know how to program, so they're not scared of it. And now they're being trained in AI as well. And I think that that learning agenda is very important to removing all these barriers to people and politics. So instead of having people resisting, you can have people contributing. 
And I think that that's one of the most important forms of transformation there is. The other challenge we have is the technology is a horizontal and yet we operate as human beings in silos because our limitations as human beings, you know, he's a corporate banker. Oh no, he's the consumer banker. He's a T and O guy. We all have our expertise. And the reality is that expertise isn't highly scalable. However, technology is a horizontal and the real value in most innovation actually lies between the silos, not in the silos. And that's a very important point. Humans can't scale. And I'll give you a great example of it. So we all know that one plus one equals 2.76. I you know, presented to an accounting uh, conference, an AI accounting conference in Malaysia yesterday. And of course, accountants would of course question 1.1, 1, 1 plus one equals 2.76. But for me, it's the difference between artificial and intelligence. So we know that insurance is a highly mathematical business and that everything that we do with actuaries and underwriters is about driving mathematical outcomes, exactly the same as banking. And as a friend uh, from the intelligence services once told me, he said, don't send in a man to do a machine's work. He was ex special forces, but also a double PhD from MIT in artificial intelligence and machine learning. So if you look at life banking, insurance is an antiquated business. The problem is that one in two people never buy. And 38, oh sorry, one in two people actually drop out during the sales process to buy insurance. And 38% of, you know, 38% of total customers inbound never buy insurance at all, even though they want it because it's too difficult. Now for one particular company that we valued, uh, that was rated at a problem of about 1.75 billion USD. So we understood that the problem was due to customer data acquisition or inquisition. So insurance companies ask you, you know, they ask you for basically 609 data points to make a decision about whether or not you should get the insurance that you want. So I developed an AI company that looked specifically at this problem after leaving AIA. And so when we did the root cause analysis, we understood that the fulcrum point or the big problem actually went back to the very core way we looked at risk. So our actuaries and our underwriters. And we looked at these 609 data points that they required. So we started to blend human experience, the expertise that we take from the human being, and then start encoding that experience into algorithms. We went through that process and got our result, 91% automation, 90% simplification. By any stretch of the imagine, this was an amazing and game-changing result. And I don't think anyone's exceeded those results in the industry yet. So the company was valued $100 million. We took, you know, in 10 months, we took that back to the customer while we celebrated, we took it to the customer and the customer started to give us this sort of response. It was like the actuaries and the underwriters weren't happy, even though we exceeded every metric that they gave it to us by a wide margin. And very simply, they said that in a very small number of cases, your results are different. There's a 1% misclassification rate. The machine made a different decision to the human being in 1% of cases. And of course their response was, it's not good enough, get out. While if you look at that 1% risk versus doubling your business, with huge margins. It was very, very minimal impact from a horizontal standpoint, but within that particular silo, it was deemed to be unsufferable. So we had our life-changing equation discovery, which was that uh, equivalent of a, a modern light bulb moment. And we understood that the humans thought that they were perfect. The underwriters and the actuaries thought they were perfect. So what we did was we turned our algorithms onto their decision-making process. And we started to look at their misclassification rates. And what we found was that their misclassification rates was 38%. One plus one equals 2.76. The problem that we found is that human expectations of technology are binary. It's on or it's off, it's right or it's wrong. AI is probabilistic like we are. And if you look at that 38% misclassification rate, it's the same reason that you can get a credit in, in university with a 35% misclassification rate. So what technology does is it completely challenges us as human beings to start looking and trusting, instrument, uh, trusting our instrumentation. As a former commercial pilot, I once sat on an AI conference with people that are, are global names in the industry, four of us on stage. You know, I, I was lucky to be there. 
but what we discovered afterwards, two men, two women, all four of us were pilots. We all learned to trust machines. So what this means is that we have many difficult board decisions to make, and we need to have people that understand the difference between emotion and logic. There are good reasons to accept emotional guidance, and there are good reasons to accept logic, and we need to make very conscious decisions about what the price to pay is. And the real challenge, as we know in the technology industry, is the technology industry approaches this, this problem with a, a growth mindset. We don't look at AI and automation as an expense reduction. We look at it a way of amplifying the human being. So to amplify and grow. If we look at you know, Apple's growth in, in, uh, in adoption, it's all been about adding people. It's never been about laying people off because they've really used technology to really scale the business. And for us, as we approach things like open banking, which is really about machine to machine and scaled networks, it's really looking at digital economics. I think there's a very simple ABC that we need to focus on. We need to focus on it and how to avail our, our core expertise, how to put it out, our core expertise, KYC, et cetera, out in APIs. Then, and enable other people to scale off the back of that. And that helps scale our utilization. The second one is to build differentiation. So APIs are a commodity, business models matter. And the third, of course, is to collaborate and co-create and the scale value with customers and partners. And I think that this is a complete rewrite of the banking industry and that a very few are going to survive. Now, the reality, if you have a look at companies like the best example in the world is actually WeBank out of China, their call center automation rate is 98%. Their account management cost, annual account management cost is 50 cents per annum. Most in the industry rank between 15 to 30 US dollars per account. So the economics are going to shift dramatically as we move to this, uh, as we move to both open banking, uh, banking as a service and, uh, and marketplace banking. All of these three are a continuum and how we design and architect our technology are going to be critical to determine our competitiveness going forward into the future. Often everyone talks about time to market and as a former technology guy, I'll tell you it's complete rubbish. There are three things that matter. Time to value. If you can't get to value, who cares? Anyone can take rubbish to market any day of the week and hit time. What matters is how quickly you can get value to the customer. Once a customer has confirmed value and once that value is also valuable for you as a company, then your next objective has to be to deliver a quality. And then only when you have quality, because if you scale something that's not of high quality, you will just lose your customer base. So only after you go time to value, time to quality, then you really focus on scale and networks. And why the focus on quality? Because if you get it right the first time from a customer experience standpoint, your NPS doubles. Technology sells itself, which is why the best models drive viral adoption, because it's just customers saying, this is so good, works every time. I really understand it. it's very ESE. So if I quickly summarize, a quick summary is learning, venturing, capital. It's the only way to go and drive mass scale transformation into technology. You've got to turn no into no. Knowledge empowers you. It also empowers everyone in your organization. And you've got to collaborate to innovate. It's not a one-man show. You've got to leverage the expertise in the, in, and the perspectives of, of the people in the company and then turn that into technology with a growth mindset that really scales the business in a way it hasn't been scaled before. And then of course, we really need to look at how we apply those innovation laws, how we understand the constraints. As uh, Melissa Meyer said, the former product manager of Google who became CEO of Yahoo, you've got to understand that uh, constraints, create, create, uh, constraints create creativity, right? Or uh, her actual phrase was, um, creativity loves constraint. So constraint give you an ability now to understand what you can and you can't do so you can focus on how to scale. And then of course, if you understand technology, economics, et cetera, and you're able to apply them with scale, then you live in your competitor's future by arbitraging time. So with that, I conclude and thank you. Over to Q&A. Thank you very much, Steve. That was um, extremely insightful, as, as always. I think uh, the, the audience has been uh, 
been been chatting and asking questions. I just wanted to kick off with a, just a couple of questions which I had. Um, we we sure. talked a lot about technology and innovation and the growth of innovation in financial services. How does that uh, how does that align with regulation, security, ethics? Um, because we we've seen a lot of technology companies, Facebook, for example, trying to get into financial services or trying to do things such as with Libra. And there's been a lot of pushback because they're not considered to have the right level of ethics, right level of security, customer protection. Do you see that as a as as a negating force to this um, acceleration of technology? I, I don't think that's necessarily. I think that's a function of Facebook, uh, less a function of technology. So if you trust security-wise, uh, having worked in the security in in the tech industry. You know, if you look at companies like Intel and regulation, trust me, they're incredibly regulated um, to, to a degree that you wouldn't appreciate because, you know, you can't even sell certain types of powered processes to certain markets, et cetera. Uh, and your IP, everyone on the planet was trying to steal. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so security wise, I would trust a tech company uh, more than you know, most financial institutions because they're, they're used to dealing with threats at, at scale. Google, you know, everyone, right? So, you know, I, I think that that part is, is interesting. The second piece around, are, are we ready as, as an economy and as, a, you know, from a regulated banking standpoint? Now, the gray area in the people, you know, uh, innovating, innovation leads legislation. So if legislation is trailing, then of course the regulator is going to take a conservative view because they don't know. So one of the things we did at DBS, if you have a look at Singapore, I used to call the monetary authority of Singapore, the merchants of no, right? Yeah, I would say, let's go do that. And that's a no, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, if you have a look at them, they lead on an innovation standpoint. They turn no into no. We, we developed relationships with agents for science and tech research because I didn't want them saying no to me. I had them say no to the uh, PhDs, right? The largest, more, more PhDs per square foot than anywhere else on the planet sits within ASTAR in Singapore. So it's important for the regulator and the industry to learn together. And I think that's the real learning. And now if you have a look what MAS and the industry are doing, FinTech Festival, et cetera, in, in Singapore. And I think Sama in Saudi is brilliant and heading in this direction. And they're working closely with Singapore as well. So you're starting to see that, that regulation is less about regulation, more about collaboration from a regulatory standpoint. So there shouldn't be, you know, I remember at DBS, it's like, don't talk to the regulator. But fortunately, the chairman of the MAS was an Australian. So, <laughs> so we could go for lunch. Uh, but that helped break down walls, right? And the moment we could turn a no into a no, then that really changed the perspective. Because what politicians and regulators really want is safety, security, and inclusion. And what in technology enables us to do is drive inclusion in ways that weren't possible before. So you're seeing that from, you know, cost of transaction accounts, et cetera, all the way, you know, so you're lowering the barriers to, to banking. And then you're actually giving access now, you know, if you've got fractionalization in, in the US and, and hopefully in Saudi soon, now you're getting driving inclusion and wealth creation for the first time ever. So these are very positive things. And I think that the risk reward equation is changing quite dramatically, but more importantly than ever, the regulator is actually getting out in front of this now and learning at a, a much faster rate than institutions in many cases. And, and, and what do you think uh, this means for the future of financial services? To appreciate, we've talked about the need, the, the combination of digital economics and technology economics, which is fundamentally driving uh, the company. And, and the companies which get that formula are going to survive, other ones which are not. Um, do, do we therefore see that the future of financial services will be dominated by big tech companies which get that formula and have already applied that formula in other industries and come into financial services? Or will we see fintech? really adopting that formula and, and, and growing, growing in the marketplace? Or will banks actually be able to continue to survive uh, by, by adjusting and adapting? So I, I think everything's sort of merging, if you'd like to think of it that way. I think the, the expertise and the existing data assets, but primarily the expertise of banks, is still differentiated from the tech companies. The actual financial structure and all this sort of thing, this is still something that's of value for banks, but not for much longer. But what we're seeing in markets, if you take a look at China as an example, WeBank, which is, was basically a fintech and then backed by Tencent, is now the, the fastest growing bank in the world. 
you know, and it's driving inclusion. It's really focusing on micro lending in a regulated environment now, instead of just the, you know, the P2P lenders before a proper regulated bank is out there really driving the market and growing at an incredible pace. This is fantastic for the economy. There are banks that are starting to do the same. There's nothing that inhibits a bank from going and doing it. You're seeing some, you know, like uh, the guy that used to work for me started the banking as a service uh, platform for Standard Chartered in Singapore. Uh, another ex-colleague is building something similar in the Middle East. Two, two of the four big B uh, banking as a service guys are all ex uh, folks that I've worked with. So it's, um, it's interesting to see. I think that that expertise gives an edge to the banks, but not if you don't take action. Unless you start recognizing the value of digital economics. If you have a look at WeBank, if you look at just HR, how big a transformation, more than 50% of employees are engineers. If you look at Digital Bank for DBS and look at the scale of what they're doing now, they have 4,000 employees that are just engineers. You know, the scale of, of that growth that's driven by digital. And, you know, the DBS, DBS are, uh, their digital customers are double net income from their traditional customers. And that, that digital move is, is, is accelerating. And as a talent, talent becomes a focal point for that, making sure the companies have the right level of talent to be able to grow um, go, going forward. And I think that's, that's something you alluded to is, is continuously learning within an organization and making sure the new skills, the retraining of the skills are there for, for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And the talent exists within banking. You know, I've been lucky enough working in Riyadh Bank. I, I've just uh, finished as chief digital officer yesterday. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, they're hugely talented people in the markets in, you know, right across the, the Gulf, right? And, and they exist within the organizations. They're, the real opportunity is to tap that talent and to empower them. And it's that, that empowerment, you know, at DBS, if you have a look at the initial innovation team, which took it from zero to 220 million and, and best digital bank in ASEAN, now supposedly best in the world, but none of them, uh, all of them came from within the bank. I was the only outsider and I was the banker, uh, previous tech industry, but, you know, I, was, I worked in Citibank, OCBC Bank, Shinsei Bank, you know, all, all these places. So, you know, so there's still value in banking. You don't have to, you have to have, you know, one of the, some of the biggest failures are actually when you've taken, you know, heads of Google or, you know, all this and transplanted them into banking and they haven't understood the banking side. <laughs> if, you, if you look at Google as a model, I think it's, you know, I pitched many years ago, I, I go to them, I said, you should make payments free. Why, why would you charge? Look at what you do with search. The value of, of a payment, the value of the data around it is far more valuable than the payment fee. So why would you not leverage your core business model into, uh, and they just couldn't get it, right? They were too focused on trying to be a bank, you know, trying to get banking talent to go tell them to be banking, you know, and, and do a traditional model. So I think that the talent advantage lies within incumbent bankers. That talent advantage is there. Skills you can train for, right? But you have to make that investment and you have to be open to learning. And it's not, you know, as I learned in DBS, it's not top down. And the CEO can, can try as he might to force change, but it's got to be this empowerment that goes both ways, right? And learning that goes around the organization. No, I think we're, we're, in, we're in for a very exciting few years in the financial services industry with, with all these changes happening in Saudi and beyond. Uh, just one final question. If I think we've got a very captive audience here who, who loves the presentation. If they wanted to learn more about this subject, is there any sources, resources, or any books you could recommend uh, that we that, that we could refer people to? Yeah, I, I would. Um, if you want to know, one other thing I think is important from an organizational design standpoint, and that is, if you look at tech companies, they're run by product managers. I mean, tech product managers. I ran the product groups at, at Dell and Compaq. Uh, banks aren't run by in, in the same way. You know, that product management discipline, you know, the people that are also the domain experts that actually understand the customer and the market, spend a lot of time out the customer's market and really, you know, assimilate that into, into products and design and iterate on value. That doesn't exist in banking. There's a book called Inspired by Marty K uh, Kagan. Uh, he worked at HP, I worked at Compaq, which was bought by HP. Um, a fantastic resource. I really recommend to, to understand product management, understand how to create value with customers. Um, I think he's done a, a great job in, in authoring that book. Excellent. On that note, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but Steve, thank you very much, especially for late, late in the evening there, but thank you very much for joining us. We've had a, a very, very insightful uh, lunchtime session here. 
Uh, thank you to everyone who's participated and, and, and enjoyed the session. Um, feel, feel free to register for other events happening on the FinTech Tour on FinTech Saudi's website, uh, forward slash tour. And, um, and, and, thank, and thank you once again, Steve. We, we hope to have you again uh, for future sessions as well. And, and here are some of the amazing insights that you have. Yeah, look, no worries at all. And uh, uh, someone's asked, uh, I think, just on the question there, Marty Kagan. It's called Inspired, I-N-S-P-I-R-E-D. And the guy's name is Marty, M-A-R-T-Y, Kagan, C-A-G-A-N. And if you have any questions, uh, you can grab my email address and, and I'm happy to just respond by email, though I'm, I'm way behind on email. I've just got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but I will catch up eventually. Not at all. We'll send a link around uh, for, with the book, with details of the book as well after the presentation. Wonderful. Thank Lovely. you very much. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt everyone's lunch. I know how valuable that is. In <laughs> so, all right. I think it was a Thank welcome you. interruption. Enjoy. Thanks a lot. Take care. Shukram. Ciao. Cheers. Bye bye.